Uh, welcome to this joint webinar being presented by Esquire Group and the Beacon Financial Education Group. Uh, this webinar is on the tax landmines for Americans investing abroad. As many of you may know, uh, being an American overseas with FATCA and much of the financial reporting and complex tax rules involving Americans' foreign assets and income, uh, investing can be quite challenging. And the Beacon Global Group is specialized in helping Americans navigate these investment challenges. My name is Jimmy Sexton. I'm the president of Esquire Group, and I'll be moderating this webinar today. And with me is David Bellingham, the managing director of Europe of Beacon Global Group. So before we get started, I'm going to start off with a little bit, a little disclaimer. This presentation was prepared for educational purposes only. This presentation is not legal, tax, or investment advice, nor is it to be construed as such. Each individual circumstances are different. You should seek legal, tax, or investment advice to address any specific questions you may have. Again, uh, my name is Jimmy Sexton. A little bit about myself. I have a bachelor's in business administration with an emphasis in finance, a JD in LLM in international taxation. I am the president of Esquire Group, uh, which is an international tax advisory firm. Uh, we have offices in Austria, Germany, the US, and the UAE. Uh, my specialty is strategic consulting in international taxation, including U.S. citizens with foreign income or assets, expatriation, family offices, succession planning, and structures for high net worth individuals. I'm fluent in English and German. If you want to know a little bit more about me, uh, link below will take you to my bio on our webpage. And now I will turn this over to David. David, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Jimmy, and thanks to Jimmy and, and the Esquire Group for this uh, opportunity to uh, present to you all today uh, on behalf of uh, Beacon Financial Education Group. I'll tell you a little bit about myself, a little bit about Beacon, and then get into some more interesting information, if you like. So I'm, I'm speaking to you now from the Netherlands, where I'm based in The Hague. I'm an international business strategist, consultant uh, across financial services and wealth management, where I've spent a uh, 20-something years across five countries uh, leading these sort of institutions. Uh, I'm MD of Europe for the Beacon Group, uh, as, as well as uh, heading up a, a consultancy business, which links us to that, and sit on the board of some other organizations as well. Uh, my education was in science, uh, master's in business administration in finance, diplomas and graduate diplomas in financial planning, and PhD in international management, which is still being carved out. Um, so I'm a native English speaker. My French is B2 and my Dutch is A1. That means if you ask me a question in French slowly, I can answer it. In Dutch, if it's anything other than the shopkeeper, I won't get much farther than uh, Ostjeblieft. And uh, that's where I'm at with that. So um, talking a little bit about the Beacon Group. Uh, Beacon uh, Group is a, an organization that was established in the U.S., uh, several years ago, the very well established financial services firm who, uh, in fact, look after the police pensions uh, across a number of states there, and we're everywhere from sort of New York to Texas uh, across the US. In, in Europe, we set up several years ago with the ambition of helping particularly Americans and US connected individuals in this part of the world who really needed some advice and guidance managing the complexities of the international financial world. Financial education specific purpose is to educate, uh, to give information and to help um, our target people, the, the, the US connected people here, to make the right decisions, to put them in touch with the right people so they can then implement those right decisions. And we, we have a global network of uh, advisors uh, across the spectrum of financial services uh, who can assist you uh, in in services and whatever your needs are. I'll just talk a little bit about um, the tax structure, the complexities, particularly within the context of investment uh, within uh, this framework for Americans. But I want to start with the, the first question that people usually ask me, uh, how do I escape the IRS? Um, the simple answer is don't try or you can't. Uh, of course, um, 
the, it, the real answer is if you really want to, you can, but it is difficult. Uh, and Jimmy, do you want to just check that slide for me, please? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me, let me see. There you go. Up. Thank you very much. Uh, the short yeah. answer is that you can't unless you take some rather drastic action, which, which includes things like giving up your US passport. Uh, a number of people have done that. Uh, of course, and it's not not straightforward or, or simple or inexpensive. Interestingly, it used to cost 450 US dollars to give up your US passport. Uh, it now costs 2,350. It's one of these uh, great markets where the, yeah. the price can be set to whatever you want. Um, and there is a lot of complexity around it. Yeah. Well, and I would just like to add add to that. You know, and, and for some people, depending on you know some factors like their net worth, their income tax mm. liability whether or not they're tax compliant, could also mm. have to pay a quite expensive exit tax uh, for giving up. Absolutely. Giving yeah. up this I think that, that's a really good point, Jimmy. You know, some people will look at it and think, well, you know, as usually you don't pay exit tax if you don't have assets of greater than $2 million, for example. But if you've been non-compliant for any of the last five years, all of a sudden you're into that, that uh, same bucket and you are liable. Or if your income had been across five-year averages above about 160 260 Five thousand uh, US dollars a year. There are some uh, some uh, traps there that can really uh, catch people out. So it is complex. I always find really interesting because you know we actually do we actually do quite a bit of work you know helping people with their expatriation. And one of the things that we always do uh, is review their five years tax returns for compliance. And it's mm. I, I'm always amazed at how many people thought they were tax compliant and weren't. And normally it was because of missteps in investing, uh, because they didn't, you know, report a foreign pension properly, or currency gains and losses, or they were in PFIX or something like that. So uh, having an advisor, you know, that that knows uh, how to invest properly is, is a big advantage for sure. Absolutely. And the first piece of advice that, that we offer at an educational level and certainly through our networks is get compliant. If you're not tax compliant do it uh, because they will find out at some stage and it's just it's just too important you know um, so the, the next question then is who is a, a us connected person uh, because this is a fairly broad net as well if you're a us citizen if you're born in the us or if you're born outside the us with one us uh, citizen parent you are considered a us citizen this is different to many countries in the world where the merely being born on the soil does not constitute you being a citizen in the US, it does. Uh, and so if you're born there, uh, you become a US citizen. I have a niece uh, of Australian parents born in LA who is a US citizen. We also have green card holders, and it's interesting that we add there whether they are expired or not. Tax residents, if you've been a tax resident, if you've been there 31 days in the current year, or as you can see on, on the slide, 183 days, which is the usual sort of six-month rule, and, and during that previous three-year period, including the current year, these can deem you a tax resident. The relevance of this is that under FATCA, the Foreign Accounting Tax Compliance Act, this is the worldwide tax net that the US introduced a few years ago, driving all this. Um, if you fall under being a US-connected person, you are liable to pay tax, therefore, on all global assets. Now, there's been a, a few interesting sort of catches with that. And if you think about it, uh, a recent example in the press a couple of years ago was the, the United Kingdom Foreign Minister, um, Foreign Affairs Minister Boris Johnson, was born in New York, left age five to return to the UK, but was considered a US citizen. So when he sold a property in the UK recently, uh, was deemed he had to pay US tax on that which he uh, begrudgingly did and seeks to become a, a citizen, which is probably good for the US because he could otherwise have been relevant to stand uh, to be president in the future. Interestingly, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is born in Austria, but a, a great American citizen now. And of course, if we look the other way in current affairs, someone like Meghan Markle, uh, US citizen born in California, now married to this uh, Prince Harry, sixth in line to the British throne, he becomes a US connected person. So I'm not sure what happens in that status of a member of a royal family becoming US connected and paying yeah, the global assets. But it's um, yeah, more complex than I'd like to try and work out. Yeah, a, a couple of things I'd, I'd like to mention on, on this slide just before we move on. 
So, so one is you're you're very right. Well, one of the things that that we have here on this slide is that you know even if you're born outside the U.S. to an American parent, that whether or not you have a passport is irrelevant to to your citizenship. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so some people you know can be born citizens, never have a passport, but still technically be considered a U.S. connected person for for U.S. tax purposes. And you can't actually expatriate generally until you're about 16. So your parents can't, for example, expatriate you. It's something that you have to do yourself. Uh, so, and, and most embassies say, you know, at 16, you would be able to make that decision to expatriate. And one of, one of the other things, and I just know this because I had an interesting case, when you're talking about the tax residence based on the substantial presence test, you know, there's a couple exceptions to that. What, one is the closer connection. If you spent, you know, if, if your center of vital interest is in another country, even if you meet the substantial presence test, you can often still not be a, considered a U.S. connected person. But the interesting case that I had was somebody that didn't qualify for the closer connection test. Uh, they were, they did meet the substantial presence test, so they were a U.S. connected person. But under the tax treaty of their home country, under the treaty tiebreaker rule, they were a non-resident for purposes of calculating U.S. income tax. Mm -hmm. So for FATCA purposes, they were still considered a U.S. connected person. They still had to file an income tax return and do all the reporting, but they didn't owe any income tax on it because of because of the mm -hmm. treaty. So that's one thing to be mind, mindful of. Yeah, that, they're really good points. And next point I was going to make is if you are a U.S. connected person, citizen or, or through some of the other um, definitions, yeah, the, the the primary need is that you do get the right advice because you may have to submit a U.S. tax return on your global income and assets uh, every year, and that's the, the the real advice that that you get cleared up. I'm going to look at in, uh, look at investments quickly because it can get quite challenging, and it, it gets a little bit like playing acronym bingo here because we have the IRS talking about PFIX under FATCA and maybe getting around that using a QEF. So I'll explain some of these terms and what they mean when they apply. A PIFIC is a passive foreign investment company. And this is an investment that if in simple terms you are a US connected person and you're invested in, we urge you, uh, subsequent to the appropriate advice, of course, that you might want to consider getting out of that and looking at something a bit more uh, perhaps tax friendly and supportive. Um, so the US government, uh, when it announced FATCA, uh, said to the institutions of the world in financial services and banking and investment that it held them responsible for uh, any investments they held that they held that were owned by a US connected person. And if it wasn't reported appropriately, they would be fined quite substantially. Subsequent to that, we saw particularly across Europe, but in a lot of international places, a lot of banks and investment management companies returning invested funds to US connected investors with a letter basically saying, thank you, but we don't want your money. It was decided it was too hard and too risky at the company's perspective to incur uh, a fine from the, uh, the US and the IRS. And so they just stopped taking US connected people. Now that created a, a, a dilemma for anyone US connected because they still have that need to invest. They have long and medium term goals for investments, whether it be retirement or whatever. And they need vehicles, particularly in, a, in an environment where cash returns are around about zero and less than inflation. Uh, but it was quite hard for them to, to, to do that. If we're looking at that, and we'll look at this example here. Before I get into it, I'll just explain for the benefit of, of everyone there, the difference between capital gains and income, uh, in case you're not clear on that. When we make an investment, whether that's in a mutual fund or, or even buying a share, it, it's quite similar in that you receive two forms of return. If you buy into that investment at $1 and after 12 months it's worth $1.05 per unit or per share, you have had an increase of 5% from 1 to 105 and that's a capital gain. The capital you have invested in has increased in value. You may or may not have realized that if that investment is still there and you're still investing in it, it's a non-realized gain. You haven't got that extra $5 in your pocket. It's still in the investment. Along the way, it may pay you a dividend. 
or income or return. And for example, for every $100, it might pay me $4 across two payments of $2 in the year. That is my dividend income of 4%. So that's five plus four, which is a, a 9% return in, in my example here that I'm talking through. It's important to understand the difference in the two because you pay tax on the dividend income as part of your income. Your capital gain, if not realised, which means you haven't sold it to put the gain in your pocket, is usually not taxable until you sell it. Now, that's, that's an important uh, consideration. When we look at in investments that uh, are made in investments that are not aligned to their US requirements in terms of the, the FATCA, they're called the P, a PFIC, a Passive Foreign Investment Company, and therefore the US tax considers capital gains and income returns, dividends, all as income. So if we look at the example on, on this slide, we have a QF election and a PFIC. A QEF election, a qualifying elective fund, makes it compliant to US tax regulations and separates capital gains and income. It sounds technical, but it's, it's actually quite important. Uh, and so in the example here, there's $100,000 invested and the returns are based on the S&P, five years return uh, from 2010 to 15. Uh, and over that five year period with an annual growth of 11.93%, it grew by $75,684 two equivalent funds. Now, in the QEF elected investment, it was able to separate capital gains and income tax. Capital gains being taxed at a, a lower rate, meaning the total tax payable was about 11,000, was 11,312, and the net gain to this investor was 64,372. The same investment, the same person, you had made the exact same investment in the same risk profiles and everything in a PFIC, non-QEF elected, would have their income and capital gains tax wrapped up and all considered as income uh, at the highest rate, potentially 36.5% or even in some cases higher than that. Uh, and in this example here, paid tax of $28,050, meaning their, their net return was 47634 So by being in the wrong type of investment from the perspective of uh, the IRS, in this example, cost an extra $16,738, which I'm sure just about everyone would think would be much better placed in their own investment or their own pocket, their own bank account, than it would be in, in the hands of the IRS uh, unnecessarily. So it is complex when we're looking for uh, investment solutions uh, for anyone who is US connected. And you can see in this example how it can really quite profoundly uh, change the amount of tax that is being paid nearly uh, sort of two and a half times the amount of tax being paid, which obviously significantly affects the result. So the, end, the analysis is that there are some, but not many, so good investment options. Uh, and there are restrictions around some of the options that we hear back. And this slide reflects a lot of the information that gets fed back to us by US investors. And one that, yes, there's cash, and we can usually be fairly confident with cash that it's stable and secure, but it, there's, there's not much return. And in some instances, it's going back backwards by the rate of inflation, depending on which bank it's sitting in. There are US listed ETFs and in their own right, they're a good solution. ETFs, exchange traded funds are, are quite an efficient way of uh, getting into an investment market. Uh, they provide tax reporting for non-US residents in the country of residence, and that can mean you're subject to, to tax in other places. Uh, they're also fairly time consuming to manage in an ongoing sense. Segregated portfolios can be useful solutions. However, they usually require high minimum standard, high minimum investments of somewhere around about 500,000, some will do it for 200,000. If you're looking at segregated, you need multiples of that. The other solution is trusts and offshore structures, which again, for some people can be right. For trusts, you, I think the argument is usually that depending on your situation, you'd need at least half a million to invest into that structure. Other offshore structures can also be good for larger amounts, but can also be rather illiquid. 
And as one thing we do know that I know from 15 years of living in many different countries is that uh, our client circumstances inevitably change. Uh, and therefore liquidity, I think, is an important aspect of an investment that at least the structure uh, allows for some flexibility there should your circumstances change. Well, one, thing, one thing I'd like to add about that when you talk about the offshore structures mm -hmm. is, yeah, certainly clients do change. And one of the things that we oftentimes see is a client will set up a structure uh, that's great for the current country of residency. And then when they move, uh, that new country, their new country taxes that structure completely differently. And uh, mm. it's no longer uh, very advantageous. So that, that's another thing to keep in mind yeah. with, with structures. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. And there are, I mean, there are, there are some very good investments out there. We talk about use its funds. It's basically, you know, it's a in collective investment in based in the European Union, which is a perfectly good investment. However, it is not appropriate for this US connected person because it is considered a PFIC. So we've got that. We've also got, as I mentioned before, institutions returning funds. We've got the currency complexities and a, a whole range of other factors making it a fairly a tough environment in which to, to invest. However, there are, there are some solutions and we're seeing a real demand for people are asking for sophisticated solutions. It doesn't have to be sophisticated in the sense of it being complex, hard to understand or hard to manage. It just has to be structured the right way. Uh, has to be approved by the appropriate regulators and, and give you as an investor the peace of mind that it's in the right structure. So the things that people are asking for are, are points that Jimmy just made, transferability. Uh, and that is at a couple of levels. The level that we just mentioned is that if you move from one country to another, which a lot of people will do, and particularly you know, in Europe or, or, or even from region to region, uh, you, if you move from one country to another, you need to be able to have either the access to change that investment or the flexibility structure that it remains compliant in your new country of residence. Other transferabilities include between family members that you can do that. Uh, reporting is very important, not only for you to know where your investments are, but also to your through to your accountant, your tax advisor, a firm like the Esquire Group or, or ultimately through to the, to the IRS. You need to have seamless tax reporting. That's, that's very important. We've been told confidentiality remains important. We all know that there's look-through provisions now in just about every country, but confidentiality at the level at least that you can hold this investment and traded as a security properly and liquidity as I mentioned before still comes up. I think the other area that, that comes up is, is obviously access to good funds, access to good investments and that, that is also a very important important area. So solutions there but they are hard to come about. Some of them require a high minimum entry uh, and some new ones are coming to market we know in the next month or so which will provide access to use its funds in a tax compliant manner for you for american citizens with liquidity and all the other advantages and that will make a, a very substantial change to uh, americans investment options making connected people uh, across across the region so i think it, it can be a minefield it can be very difficult uh, not only getting but staying fact compliant understanding the environment itself just a couple of years ago, we were hearing statistics that up to 90% of people were not compliant. I think that's improved substantially, uh, but still it's important that you do get compliant and stay compliant and overcome that that sort of inertia that a lot of people will take to things who, who take the position that it's just so complex, I'll just do nothing because I'm scared of taking the wrong decision and, and incurring the wrath of the, the tax office. So by getting good advice and by accessing appropriate investments, you can act within the, the bounds and with the expectations of the, the regulators and the IRS, meet your obligations for reporting uh, and for tax as, as required, and be in an investment that is structured in such a way that you're getting as good a result as any other individual in the world and not unnecessarily paying tax on capital gains, for example, uh, or missing out on those investment opportunities. So the, the specifics of where you should be investing come, or come to you after you've had advice. And I think that's the other important piece of information we always give is get advice. It's, it's important to get good advice 
it's all about the value, the, the qualifications of the, the person you're speaking with, the independence, the, the ability of that person to act in an independent manner, putting your interests first and in a transparent manner so you're knowing what you pay for. It's not about getting it the cheapest, it's about getting it the best and understanding what you're paying for and, and valuing that and getting a good result because of it. That will lead you towards uh, the right investment structure allowed you to make some good investment decisions to improve your financial life and achieve your goals, which is ultimately why why we all do it and why you, why you would want to um, be doing that in the first place. Um, so there's a, a lot of information to, I guess, digest in those few slides. It is fairly dense, but there's um, rather important information. Jimmy, would you like to add anything at that point? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to, to add that uh, I think that what you said is is absolutely uh, correct. Is that you know when whether it comes to international tax or international investing or a combination, mm -hmm. uh, you know the focus needs to be on on finding the best, getting the right advice, not the cheapest advice, because in in the end the cheapest advice will wind up costing you much much more. Uh, David, I just wanted to to thank you for taking the time to share your expertise with. Uh, with myself and, and our attendees. I know that this is very relevant information for a, a lot of our clients, and uh, I hope that they found this useful. Well, well thank you for the opportunity again and for, for uh, Beacon to be able to work with Esquire to deliver this information. We are passionate about getting education and information to American uh, citizens and U.S. connected people around the world and uh, helping them to educate themselves to make good financial decisions in their life. Great. Well, David, I hope we get to do this again sometime. Uh, thank you again, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank Bye. you, everyone.